This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated online cinema streaming exceptional films from around the globe. Get one month free at MUBI.com slash beyondtheframe. Hey, that's the name of the show. About a year ago, I was making a video essay concerning the relationship between monsters and men in the work of Bong Joon-ho. I wanted to start out by illustrating that in his movies, the more horrific actions are carried out by men, not monsters. So I used this very graphic footage from Barking Dogs Never Bite. A few days later, I heard back from my editor. I know you're describing monstrous deeds from Bong's films, but we need to show clips other than animal cruelty. That's a fast track to a visceral reaction from viewers that will make people forget about the larger point you're making. Perhaps there are other clips where people behave badly but aren't hurting dogs? Huh. That got me thinking. We care a lot about animal violence. Too much, maybe? Discouraging data on the antidepressants. <laughs> now you would think, well, look, most of you laughed at that, right? You thought it was funny. In general, that seems like a funny cartoon, but let's look what online survey I did. I don't like to see animals suffer, even in cartoons. <laughs> This example is extreme, but it still begs the question. How are we so squeamish about fake animal violence when we live in a culture that is so heavily dependent on real animal suffering? And to put, movies also come with a disclaimer, guaranteeing that no animals were harmed. But we didn't always care so much, and that stamp of approval is actually quite recent. In fact, it was the 1939 movie Jesse James that started us on a path to change the way we view and treat animals on screen with this cliffhanger. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Birds do it. Bees do it. This story starts with Edward Muybridge, a pioneering English photographer. First, he shot and killed Major Harry Larkins. Somebody shoots you. He at the time was his wife's lover. Smoking. He was later acquitted on the grounds of justifiable homicide. His claim to fame, however, came when he shot, but didn't kill, a horse. In 1897, he used 12 different cameras, activated by tripwires, to capture his body in motion, forging a lasting link between cinema and animals. Even educated fleas. Early on, the spectacle of animals in film was divided in two. First, the documentaries. They consisted of pretty basic actions, like animal feeding, with barely any narrative. Audiences quickly and comprehensibly became bored. According to Derek Pusey, feeding was quickly replaced by hunting, stasis by action, and ultimately, nurturing by killing. Then there was fiction. We got the first hint of what an animal movie star looks like in 1905. He went by the name of Rover. He was a collie who helped retrieve a stolen baby. In the 20s, there was Ron Tan Tan, Rin Tin Tin, as well as Strongheart, and later on Lassie, the dogs from Dogville Shorts, Bonzo the Chimp, Fagan the Lion, and all manner of animal stars that were box office successes. In fact, the top grossing film of the 40s was an animal that was literally drawn to success. The story of animal triumph on screen is, however, tainted by a history of violence written in blood, pain, and trauma. Birds do it. Cinema and animal cruelty go hand in hand from the start. Still in the 19th century, Marta Braun filmed an exposed and beating dog's heart. In 1903, Edison released a film with the title Electrocuting an Elephant. I think you can guess where this is going. In Hollywood, it was the Wild West for the treatment of animals. They were there to serve the filmmakers, with little to no regard for their well-being. Rob Block, the owner of the training company Creatures of the Cinema, supplier of animals for motion pictures, television, and whatnot, described animal training for show business as an activity for the tough people only. Quote, It was a heavy-handed business, in which people would kill an animal just to get a shot. Animals were just stock or props. One of the worst cases of abuse happened on the set of the original 1925 Ben-Hur. 150 horses were killed in the chariot scene, an average of 19 horses per minute of film. Ten years later, nothing had changed. 
In 1936, Errol Flynn starred in the charge of the Light Brigade. Reporting our return from Calcutta, sir. In his memoir, Flynn describes the treatment of the horses this way. Horses have been the most badly treated animals in the motion picture industry, especially in the days when these early westerns were being ground out. A device called the Running W was used on horses, a tripwire to make the animals tumble at the right instant. The stuntman knew where the tripwire was. He knew when he had to get off, and all he had to do was take a fall. But the horse would go head first and sometimes get hurt and have to be shot. They stopped this because so many horses broke their legs and their necks, and there were protests by the actors and public. In that film, 120 horses were tripwired and at least 25 died. Sadly, the complaints inside and outside Hollywood brought no real change until three years later. In 1939, numerous horses reportedly died to make stagecoach. Outside the US, things didn't look much better. In Renoir's rules of the game, real rabbits were killed for the hunting scene. In the year while this was happening, the straw that broke the camel's back was the death of a single horse. Birds do it. Bees do it. In the midst of a pursuit, Jesse and Frank James were driven off a cliff over 70 feet from the ground. A stuntman made the jump. Sadly, he lost his hat. The horse broke his back and had to be shot. And that's where American Humane comes in. The people behind the disclaimer, no animals were harmed. The group led a charge to boycott the movie, causing public outcry. Feeling the pressure to avoid litigation, several major studios arranged the meeting with the AA. Here's my idea. It's great. As the result, the now called Motion Picture Association of America acknowledged American Humane as the official watchdog for animals in the film industry. They then made plans to work together in order to establish protections for animals in film. The following year, they set up a Hollywood office, created rules that had to be followed by filmmakers, trained overseers that were allowed to monitor animal action on all film and TV sets, all of this in an official capacity. For years, this resulted in a significant reduction of animal cruelty in film sets. But all good things come to an end. I'm sure giraffes on the slide. Now here's the problem. The power to monitor studio sets was given to American Humane by the Hayes Office, the organization that enforced the moral code in Hollywood from the early 30s up to the late 60s. The code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. It states the considerations which good taste... And because even bad things must come to an end, in 1966, the Supreme Court disbanded the Hayes Office, which was great for filmmakers in general, who no longer had to work on a tight leash, but terrible for the animals, because American Humane lost its right to access film sets. While the organization was still present during some shoots, they lost their power to intervene. That resulted in a marked increase of incidents of abuse, injuries and deaths in movie productions. We can go through the list, but here's just a few famous examples of the neglect that followed. In Apocalypse Now, a buffalo was slaughtered. In Pink Flamingo, a chicken had its head snapped during a sex scene. In The Wild Bunch, a scorpion was tortured and killed by ants. And in another Sam Peckinpah film, live chickens were pulverized with bombs. So the camel had to break its back once more for changes to take place for good. And that happened in 1980 on the set of Heaven's Gate. If, like me, you need to take a breather from all this animal suffering, you don't need to look any further. Here's Mubi, a curated online cinema streaming exceptional movies from around the globe. Every day, they present a new film, and every day, they take one away. There are always 30 perfectly curated films to discover on Mubi. Now showing exclusively on the platform is Ryushi Sakamoto, Koda, fresh from its release in US theaters. The film tells the story of a techno-pop star, an anti-nuclear activist, and an Oscar-winner composer who was also behind the soundtrack of The Adventures of Milo and Otis, a movie we'll be discussing in the next episode. But in the meantime, try Movie Free for 30 days at movie.com slash beyond the frame. That's movie.com slash beyond the frame for your extended free trial. Are you still there? Well, good. Here's the plan. 
In part two, I'm going in depth into American humane work since the events on the side of Heaven's Gate. I'll explain how a movie can earn or lose the no animals were harmed disclaimer. I'll also discuss the polemics surrounding American humane and why a lot of animal lovers think they're actually not very good at their jobs. If that's something you'd like to see, I've set up a Patreon account where you can contribute and help me continue making this sort of thing. You also get an extended free trial with Mubi for an extra 60 days. But most important, a percentage of the donations will go directly into purchasing this amazing cat mate, fresh water drinking fountain for cats and small dogs. I, I, I think she deserves it.